Good morning. Um, this is uh, EGU press conference on new sustainable coal technologies. Today we have Thomas Kemka of the Center for CO2 Storage in Potsdam. We have Thomas Fernandez of RWTH Aachen and Michael Kuhn of GFZ Potsdam. Uh, they will speak about sustainable coal technologies which play an important future in, uh, role in future energy extraction. Most remaining coal deposits are located at great depths that complicate their extraction. They have developed a new technology that enables extraction at great depths without too much damage for the environment. Thomas, would you like to start? Thanks a lot. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to give you a short introduction into the topic. We are talking today about sustainable energy technologies and the potentials and challenges we have to deal with. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to mention that we are from research institutions from Germany, so we don't have any interest with coal industry. We are just doing research. So let's start with a basic overview of the vertical section of northern Germany. This is an example for the situation in Central and Northern Europe. So as you can recognize here, we have in red the current mining area, which is mined in the Ruhr district. Then you see in black the Carboniferous, which dips down to the north, and the Carboniferous is actually the layer, the geological layer, where we have the coal seams. Um, for example, in the Münsterland area, we have um, cap rock thickness of nearly 2,000 meters and the coal goes down to the North Sea where we have a cap rock thickness of 5,000 meters. So how can we get to this coal using an economical and sustainable way? This is the question and this is why we introduce the principle of underground coal gasification combined with CO2 capture and storage. How does it work? We are using directional drillings to develop the coal seam this means we connect the injection well with a production well and in the next step we use an oxidant consisting of oxygen and water vapor to start a gasification process in the coal deposit. By this we have a substoichometric combustion, this means we have a lack of oxygen and we generate a synthesis gas consisting of mainly consisting of hydrogen, methane and other constituents. So what can we do with this gas? At the surface, we can use this gas, first of all, to produce methanol. We can produce hydrogen, but we can also electrify this gas and use it for electricity generation. What's the next step? The next step is that we separate CO2 from the flue gas that is in, uh, produced in this process. And this CO2 can be now injected back into the already converted coal deposits. So this is the basic idea. We are planning to set up a carbon <coughs> cycle here. So also inject the carbon back to the ground. Good. Now there's maybe one question may arouse, namely, is there enough coal in such depths? We have here an overview of the vertical coal seam distribution thickness in the rural area. And what you see here is that the conventional mining is conducted up to 1,600 meters. And below that, you can recognize that we have plenty of coal resources available. And actually, this is the depth, not actually the area we plan, but this is the depth we plan to use or where we plan to apply the technology. Good. Let's get to the potentials. What you see here is the primary energy consumption of Europe. And let's just go through some different examples, what we could do with this technology. So first of all, if we would like to substitute nuclear energy, we would have a range of energy supply by about 530 years. If we extend this to natural gas, which is also a very important primary energy in Europe, we would have an energy supply guarantee for 185 years. Now let's take a look at the most relevant imported primary energy sources. If we would try to substitute these with UCG CCS, we would have a range of 89 years where we could provide energy. And if we take the whole cake, we would have nearly 70 years of energy supply. What I'd like to show here is um, we are actually not interested in having just 
one energy source, we, we also think that the energy mix is very important to guarantee our energy supply here. We want to show the potentials here of this coal technology. So maybe this is the most interesting slide because here we discuss the competitiveness of this technology. As you can see in red, we have different scenarios here. So the first one on the right side, I'd like to point here right now, but maybe you see it here at the bottom right, this dot here. Thanks. This is a UCG fired combined cycle plant where we don't uh, account any CO2 capture and storage. As you can see, we have quite the CO2 emissions of um, standard hard coal fire, uh, fired power plant, but the price is definitely lower. When we go now to the next step on the left, we have a CO2 capture and storage scenario of 50%. By this, the price is rising up to, 40, uh, up to $55 per megawatt hour. But we get into the range of CO2 emissions of a nat natural gas fired combined cycle plant. And now when we take into account the maximum feasible CO2 capture rate at the, uh, at the combined cycle plant of 86%, we get into the CO2 emission range of a nuclear, fired, uh, nuclear power plant. But as you can recognize, the price here is about 20% below the, the one of the energy generation from the nuclear power plant. So in total, I'd like to sum up, this technology is very competitive on the market. And I would like to add that we have made a very, very conservative calculation here. So there are a lot of factors we could also include. Okay, as nice as, as it sounds, we have some problems and I would like to address them too. First of all, we have environmental concerns. The big problem about coal mining is always ground subsidence, which is related to, to different processes. And this is actually a thing we are investigating. I'd like to show you this picture here. Maybe you can recognize this is a, a figure of the d vertical displacement arousing from the cavity generation, which, which um, re is related to the combustion process. So we have here um, cavities of a height of one meter. This is in a depth of 1,000 meters. And maybe you can't recognize it here, but I will tell you we have in a distance of 40 meters, we have a vertical displacement of just two millimeters. So if you continue this and get to the surface, you can realize that there will be no ground subsidence at the surface in this case. But if we have coal seams that are stuck up and we use multiple coal seams for energy generation, this is another question we have to take into account and this has to be investigated. So just to say one thing, we have to do further research here. It is very important. So it's important for sustainability and also for economics of this technology. Next aspect is aquifer pollution. During the underground coal gasification process, we generate pollutants. <coughs> um, we have to take into account hydrogeological processes for this. This is very important. Next aspect is the safety of the CO2 storage which we have also to take into account and actually we're doing a lot of work in this uh, in this project here which I will present um, actually presenting and finally since CO2 is a very good solvent pollutants that we generated during the gasification process could dissolve and be transported with CO2 migration well actually just some things about our current research we have we have a sampler area with a size of 25 square kilometers. As you can see, it is very well explored. We have about 13 deep drillings here. And yeah, it's a bit too bad I can show it with a pointer right now. But well, yeah, I think I used the map. Well, <laughs> I try to use the mouse. So what you see here is a cap rock with a thickness of around 1,000 meters. And below that, we have the Carboniferous. We have seven coal seams here. And this is a fault you also recognize here. So we will use this area for a theoretical study. It's actually not a pilot project. We'll do a theoretical study to investigate hydrogeological processes. We'll investigate geotechnical processes. We'll investigate the processes of CO2 storage here. So I'd like to sum up. As you've seen, we have remarkable potentials, especially for the coal deposits that are available in Central and Northern Europe. Um, 
According to our calculations, this technology can definitely compete on a European energy market, but we have to take into account the geological boundary conditions because they are very important for the whole economics and finally for the sustainability <coughs> of CO2 storage and so on. As scientists, we don't have any in special interests in coal, but we would like to show that this could be a bridging te technology to renewable energy technologies. And finally, as I've shown on the last slide, we need scientific research here. This is quite important, so there has to be some, something done about it. So actually, I'd like to mention that we do these studies in a CO2 sinus project, with, which is actually funded by the German Ministry for Research and Education and by the German Research, research Association. Um, this is funded within a geotechnologie program. So thanks a lot for your attention. Want me to do it in English or can I ask them in German? English. English, okay. Uh, Patrick Tudy in Swiss Broadcasting Corporation, Public Radio. Um, so you want to inject water into the ground, if I got it right? It would be wa water vapor. Water mm -hmm. vapor. Um, just kind of like an uh, anecdote. They were dr in, in Basel, around Basel, they were dr uh, digging for um, deep heat mining. And there were some earthquakes mm -hmm. resulting from the water they injected into the ground. So they had to stop the whole project. Um, how do you tackle the problem of maybe releasing uh, earthquakes? Um, good. Actually, <coughs> actually we, are, we have to set up very high pressures for, for the whole process of up to 90 bars or 9 MPA. And by this, we will already know if the whole reservoir is tight and we can proceed with this technology. And um, actually we, we are looking at very different um, deposits um, and different geology. Maybe you want to say something. I think in Basel you have a very special situation. You are close to a um, large fault system which, where you are in the middle of a big stress field. And if you start in to press their water in, these fluids make it easy that these ruptures are start moving. And I think this was one of the problems in Basel. As far as I saw, the microquakes, they're quite orientated to the stress field. In this case, you're right, this might happen. If we have, like Thomas told already, if you use a lot of stress, a lot of pressure in injection, this might result in microquakes. But anyhow, as he described, before we can implement the plant, we have to set the field under pressure, because this process works only proper if you have a controlled pressure environment. Because the pressure has a lo very large impact on the quality of the coal conversion to methane or to uh, hydrogen generation. So you test before with air, before you start with your production process. So have always a test before, and this is also very important later on if you want to store your CO2. You must be sure that you don't, that you don't have any leakage. So this is probably an advantage of this technology, that you have a pressure set up environment where you enhance the pressure to a certain level and you can control it before you start with production. Actually, I would like to add that we have a lot of experience from oil and gas industry regarding gas storage. Well, it's a, not a completely new field of research. Um, when do you think your technology might actually be able to use for real on a large scale? Um, there have been pilot, pilots already worldwide, so I think the the basic technology, underground coal gasification, is, uh, could be productive in about 15 years. When we couple this with CO2 storage, actually we have some CO2 storage projects running at the uh, German Research Center for Geosciences. I think we are talking about the time span of 15 to 20 years right now. 
You just mentioned that you uh, can rely on the available know-how on gas storage from the industry. Could you perhaps elaborate on that a bit more? What would you like to know? <laughs> Whatever you want to tell me. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, maybe we, we could uh, here um, drop in this uh, Katzin side again, so what we are um, working on in, in, at the GFZ in, in Potsdam. Could you just uh, bring this uh, one slide? Oh, yeah, one slide. Um, so what I would like to add here is uh, that this uh, underground coal gasification is another part and it could be uh, another important part of our portfolio to mitigate the, the climate, so to reduce our CO2 emissions. And uh, what you have seen here, we have a, a very interesting combination between uh, sources and sinks at the same place. So what uh, you might have learned uh, from uh, the press conference on Monday where we talked about uh, CO2 storage in general um, is that uh, you do have uh, sources and sinks not at the same place normally and uh, that you need to think of how to transport the CO2 to these areas and uh, then to store it in, in uh, appropriate uh, formations. And uh, in general, because we have to rely uh, at least for a couple of decades or even longer uh, for our energy um, on coal. Um, this might be a very good idea to, to work on. It's, um, I think, in, in an early research stage or probably a revived research stage. So, um, so to my knowledge, there, there has been some, some um, research in, in the 80s. I suppose, and uh, now it comes back because uh, of, of uh, the whole situation. And uh, if you have a look here onto this slide, you can see uh, our um, pilot site where we are studying the CO2 storage. Uh, Thomas uh, told you that uh, the leakage uh, is an important factor, so you, we, we have to take care that the CO2 stays where we put it. Um, this is relevant for um, the underground coal gasification as well as the CO2 storage in saline aquifers as you can see here and our pilot site consists of three boreholes where we inject the CO2 since last year in June and uh, where we do have two observation wells close by and we are testing here uh, especially geophysical uh, uh, measurements or me um, methods to make uh, the, the CO2 visible, so to, to, to make a 3D, 4D visualization of the CO2 plume underground and um, to calibrate and, uh, uh, and set up our methods to predict how the CO2 is uh, moving, m migrating underground and uh, to, to check the capacities in these uh, reservoirs for the storage as well as to make sure that the CO2 stays where it is and, and to quantify if the CO2 which has been inje injected is still in the reservoir and uh, all together I think in a couple of, of years we can make some uh, or bring some benefit here to the public with these different projects. Any more questions? Thomas, you've done all this research in Germany, which is a country where there's a lot of public opposition <coughs> against anything coal or CO2. How are you expecting to be able to handle any objections or criticism from the general public? I think th this is the point where we stressed very much there is, has to be done some additional research. Um, for some parts there, in fact, there were also studies in the United States from the Environmental Protection Agency where we have a statement, the environmental concerns are handleable, but we couldn't find the studies for this. So um, this is a, a situation I can say, point out, oh, they say that's fine, but I think that's not enough for us. So, and this was what Thomas really stressed, for example, one thing where we might see a big problem might be the aquifer pollution. Because at the moment we are in this project, also in the other CO2 projects, we use these deep saline aquifers. They are, from our recent knowledge, not that important for water supply because we don't use them for direct water supply. But what are probably some 
counter effects, effects we haven't investigated yet because they were basically in oil industry very important because they keep the pressure of the reservoir up but they were not so for our normal life we didn't care for them that much so there we have to really go in deeper investigations of what might happen and especially um, Thomas mentioned CO2 is also a solutant so this means it can also transport out some and inside by the gasification process we have definitely there will be a production of some uh, materials which are usually we don't want to get in contact with our environment so they should be or they must stay in this either in this cavity or in this area where we converted the coal we must guarantee this or it must be possible to take it out before we leave it for a storage option so we can think about spilling and the other point is um, subsidence there are two points and I think this very often if you talk to people um, they are big concerns of people who live in mining areas because there is a long tradition that people know their houses break down they have cracks in their houses so that's a real concern of experience and this is also in hazards you see the same people who have experience with certain hazards have a certain opinion from my side now, from an engineering geological aspect, I don't, wouldn't expect the same kind of subsidence we have in long wall mining. Because in long wall mining we are talking of large fields. They must be as large as possible to be efficient. This means a whole area will go down a little bit. And if you have a stack of coal, then it goes down in the middle a little bit more. But also, if you look, for example, for tunneling, the deep tunnels in Switzerland or uh, Austria, if we look to geology, the overburden pressure is not kept by the tunnel construction. We have something like an arch structure, so the mountain itself stabilizes. And that's an effect we also expect here because we have a very large overburden. This means Thomas showed this graph where we have about 40 meters of direct influence and probably we'll have it a little bit, there will be a little bit more, but we're talking about 2,000 meter overburden. And then another aspect is the field layout. And this is also something we have to make further research about. Do we try to make as large as possible fields, like in long wall mining, or do we think of something like having pillars in between, saying we have a 200 meter field, and then we have a 200 meter pillar or a 40 meter pillar and again a field. This was the reason why in this graph there was, this was not one long line, there was an interruption. Because we are very interested in what might be an appropriate field layout to face the problem of subsidence and keep it really as small as possible. I would like to add something here. So. Um what Thomas said is that uh, there is a lot of research still to be done, but if we can make sure with the research uh, this is a, an appropriate way to, uh, to use the coal, there is a great advantage um, to, um, what, uh, with regard to, to your questions or the objections of the public against coal that uh, normally, almost, at least half of the coal in Germany is uh, um, uh, produced by open pit mining. So, and this is, uh, you can't see it anymore, so it's, it's far down. So if, if it's safe to use this coal in that way, we could get rid of uh, the open pits as well, which uh, are uh, in the focus of the public. So this, I think, is, is a, a very um, great advantage of this method. Just a short question of understanding. Um, What's kind of like the, the, the temporal sequence? Um, how long you um, inject and extract the gas, and then for how long you can um, inject the CO2? Mm -hmm. And what's the, the, the sequence? Can you do it at the same time? I don't think so. It's one after the other. Yeah, it's, it works like that. We, we have one power plant with six, 600 megawatts. So and to supply this, we need nine square kilometers of coal the average thickness of 1.5 meters. Um, the, 
runtime or operating time of this plant is about 20 years. So in total we will use each coal field or each coal seam for around three years. So after three years you will have an empty coal field where you can inject. After three years, you can start injecting the CO2 right. and then switch to the next mm -hmm. uh, field, uh, coal yeah. field. That's the basic idea. Besides that, just for the first phase, for the first three years, we could use, for example, saline aquifers if we have them in the area to store the CO2. Actually, it's not about storing 100% of the CO2. We have seen the capture technology is at 86% right now but to reduce the CO2 emissions in comparison to other technologies. So for example, if you could reduce the CO2 emissions to 50% and get into the range of a natural gas-fired power plant, this would be a very good option to change uh, the climate change. A good, co good contribution. And since we have coals all over the world, it's quite an interesting technology. I showed the potentials here for Europe for, for worldwide, they are even higher. We are talking about 270 years of supply of substitution of all energy sources. Anyhow, this, this is not the solution for the whole problem. This may be one stone in this mosaic on our way to reduce, reduce CO2 emission and come to a energy production without CO2 emission. But it may help, and this was this bridging technology to do our way to win some time to develop this sustainable renewable technologies but we have no emission anymore because I think this is the important point to be fast now to be quick to develop technologies bridging where we have a strong reduction of CO2 emission and besides this science must go on to develop the sustainable technologies time for one last question So, Thomas, Michael, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, do you know of any other groups who are doing similar work to this, using both the storage and the underground classification? Actually, we know about a European project named HUGE, which is also investigating UCG, but they have another approach for CO2 storage. Actually, I can't tell you that much about it, because they, at this time there are no publications I know about their CO2 storage concept. I know about their gasification concepts. But internationally, there are some studies in Britain. There's an official study from the, I think it was the Ministry of, Energy, of uh, Economics, and in the United States also where the EPA, the Lawrence Laboratories, were engaged to this topic. So also in other countries, combinations of underground coal gasification and storage are at least discussed. Uh, they are discussed, but I think um, there is not much research in that area. We have a, I think we had about 50 pilots on UCG, but there is actually no pilot on UCG CCS right now. Looking into the future, where do you think this technology is going to be in, say, 10 to 25 years? This depends on our research results. As scientists, we, we first of all want to see if this technology is feasible, if it's environmentally friendly. It has to be sustainable, though, else it's not interesting. And then we'll see. <laughs> well, probably in the next, I think, period of five years, you will have a good outlook if it yeah. may be applied. I think this is the, the, the realistic range where you have the answers to say, okay, it is interesting to go into a test and make a pilot. And anyhow, a lot of, of the parts used in this technology are parallel developed by other CO2 reduction projects, like power plants, um, the um, capture technologies, uh, we have um, liquid, uh, coal to liquids, all these technologies fit very well to this technology, and also the CO2 storage in investigations which are done outside this project can be very good link to this project. So it's a, a niche in between the, the big bucket we have and we are doing research at the moment in the frame of CO2 reduction 
and this might be one option we can use in the middle. Anyhow, Thomas said this last environmental concerns we have to be sure that it works without concerns. So with regard to the CO2 storage, I would like to say that uh, within the next 10 years we have to find answers to the last questions and then have uh, to decide if CCS or CO2 storage is uh, uh, a good way to go. Okay, thank you very much for coming. This was a press conference on underground CO2 storage and energy generation, EGU 2000.